Welcome, welcome, one and all, to Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar. So this is a game that I have played. I, I believe I played it. I played all of the Ultima series. Uh, my name is Keith Hughes, by the way, uh, in case you didn't know who I am. Uh, but I played these games when I was um, in high school. And I think I played Ultima 4, although I don't necessarily recall this specific game, other than, although certain elements do sound vaguely familiar to me. Um, and uh, I came across this on uh, GOG Games, and it was and it was free, and I thought, oh, that would be fun to do, and I decided to record it and, uh, and release it here on the YouTubes. So, um, yeah, let's get into looking at this game. So there are a number of... Uh, this is a very intricate um, game here. You've got the map. Here's the map of the world that we're in. As you can see, they've got a whole runic language, and it comes with multiple um, multiple uh, documents that you can download that have uh, a lot of information on it. There's a spell book, and a clue book, and a manual, and, and, and all this stuff, and this map. Um, and uh, all of this was included in the game. And you can tell from, from this picture here that uh, there's creases here. They actually gave you this map. It was a cloth map. And that's one of the things that I remember is I remember getting this cloth map that you could, that you could spread out. Um, there is, especially the beginning here, there is a lot of text that I'm going to be reading through. This is a text-based game, and I do not have a quiet keyboard. So you are going to be hearing tippity-tappeting of keys on here um, as we go through this game because it's all it's graphical obviously you can see the types of graphics it has but all your commands are keyboard commands on this thing so uh, let us get going on Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar so we could uh, return to the view if we wanted to that we were just on we can journey onward if we were going to uh, if we were already running a game but we're going to initiate a new game so I'm going to type in I and what is the name thou shalt be known in this world and time? And I will go with my usual gizmo. Art thou male? I'll play male. Not that it really matters all that much, I don't think. I've never played female in these games. The day is warm, yet there is a cooling breeze. The latest in a series of personal crises seems insurmountable. You are being pulled apart in all directions. Yet this afternoon walk in the countryside slowly brings relaxation to your harried mind. The soil and strain of modern high-tech living begins to wash off in layers. That willow tree near the stream looks comfortable and inviting. The buzz of dragonflies and the whisper of the willow swaying branches bring a deep peace. Searching inward for tranquility and happiness, you close your eyes. A high-pitched cascading sound like crystal wind chimes impinges on your floating awareness. As you open your eyes, you see a shimmering blueness rise from the ground. The sound seems to be emanating from this glowing portal. It is difficult to look at the blueness. Light seems to bend and distort around it, distort around it, while the sound waves become so intense they appear to become visible. The portal hangs there for a moment, then with the rush of an imploding vacuum, it sinks into the ground. Something remains suspended in midair for a moment before falling to the earth with a heavy thud. Somewhat shaken by this vision, you rise to your feet to investigate. A crude circle of stone surrounds the spot where the portal appeared. There is something glinting in the grass, in the glass, grass. You pick up an amulet shaped like a cross with a loop at the top. It is an ankh, the sacred symbol of life and rebirth. But this could not have made the thud. So you look again and you find a very large book wrapped in thick cloth. With trembling hands you unwrap the book. Behold, the cloth is a map, and within lies not one book but two. The map is of a land strange to you, and the style speaks of ancient cartography. The script on the cover of the first, first book is arcane but readable. The title is The History of Britannia, as told by Kyle the Younger. 
The other book is disturbing to look at. Its small cover appears to be fashioned out of some sort of leathery hide, but from what creature is uncertain. These reddish-black skin radiates an intense aura suggestive of ancient power. The tongue of the title is beyond your ken. You dare not open the book and disturb whatever sleeps within. You decide to peruse the history. Settling back under the willow tree, you open the book. You read the book of history. The book of history is actually one of the things that we, that uh, comes with the book. And, and so like I have it in PDF mode. Um, no, really, read the book of history. And this thing is massive. It's... it's um, 18 pages, I think it is. Um, 21 pages of, uh, well, actually, it's more than that. It's 21 PDF pages. So it's uh, it's probably more like 40 pages of actual, actual, yeah, 35, 36. So it's, there's a, everything you want to know is, is in the history. You've got uh, what are the different classes of people. You know, we've got mages, we've got bards, we've got fighters and druids and tinkers and paladins and rangers and shepherds. Uh, we've got a description of the mercantile class in Britannia. So you got the weapon shops, you can buy weapons, you have the armory, you have the pub, um, you know, where you can obviously get food and drink, you can also get news, you've got the grocery, uh, where you can get uh, food to take with you. you got healers, you have an inn. You have an herb shops where you can buy um, uh, various ingredients that you need to make um, reagents for uh, spells. Uh, and then the guild shop, um, which is mainly the thieves guild. And then you've got shrines, and then you've got a seer um, in, in certain places. Uh, talks about transportation, about moving through various types of terrain. We'll certainly get into that. Uh, as we play the game, we got what are the different types of weapons. It was very detailed description of of everything, and I'm not going to bother, certainly not going to bother reading it to you. And um, so we will pretend, for the moment, that we have read that. Uh, and continue on. Closing the book, you again pick up the ankh. As you hold it, you begin to hear a hauntingly familiar lute-like sound wafting over a nearby hill. Still clutching the strange artifact, you rise unbidden and climb the slope. In the valley below, you see what appears to be a fair. It seems strange that you come this way earlier and notice nothing. As you mull this over, your feet carry you down towards the site. This is no ordinary traveling carnival, but a renaissance fair. The pennants on the tent tops blow briskly in the late afternoon breeze. The ticket taker at the Ren Fair's gate starts to ask you for money, but upon spotting your ankh says, Welcome, friend. Enter in peace and find your path. The music continues to pull you forward amongst the merchants and vendors. Glimpses of fabulous treasures can be seen in some of the shadowy booths. These people are very happy. They seem to glow with an inner light. Some look up as you pass and smile, but you cannot stop. The music compels you to move onward through the crowd. Through the gathering dusk, you see a secluded gypsy wagon sitting off in the woods. The music seems to emanate from the wagon. As you draw near, a woman's voice weaves into the music, saying, You may approach, O oh seeker. You enter to find an old gypsy sitting in a small curtained room. She wears an ankh around her neck. In front of her is a round table covered in deep green velvet. The room smells so heavily of incense that you feel dizzy. Seeing the ankh, the ancient gypsy smiles and warns you never to part with it. We have been waiting such a long time, but at last you have come. Sit here and I shall read the path of your future. Upon the table she places a curious wooden object like an abacus, but without beads. In her hands she holds eight unusual cards. Let us begin the casting. 
the gypsy places the first of two cards upon the table. They are the cards of honesty and sacrifice. She says, consider this. Thee and thy friend are valiant, but penniless warriors. Thou both go out to slay a mighty dragon. Thy friend thinks he slew it. Thee did. When asked, dost thou A, truthfully claim the gold, or B, allow thy friend the large reward? Oh, dear me. So, um, hmm. What this is, so apparently I cl I killed the the uh, the dragon, but uh, my friend is claiming it now. Obviously, what we're doing here is we're building a we're building a um, what our character is going to be. We're building our stats here through this through this quiz, and you can see we're going to have about seven questions. Look like they're like this. Um, so should I pick A or B here? I think I'm. I'm I want to. I'm, I'm. I'm interested to see what happens if I pick B. So let's pick B. The gypsy places two more of the cards upon the table. They are the cards of compassion, and spirituality. She says, "Consider this. Thou hast been taught to preserve all life is sacred. A man lies fatally stung by a venomous serpent. Serpent." He pleads for a merciful death. Dost thou A, show compassion and end his pain? Or B, heed the spiritual beliefs and refuse? I think I would. Yeah, it's funny. This one I have less trouble with. Uh, at least in a game comp, uh, uh, context. Uh, and I'm going to do A. I'm showing compassion. I, I don't know what the, the beads mean. I've, I've been through this several times. I don't know what it means. The gypsy places two more of the cards on the table. They are the cards of valor and justice. She says, consider this. Thou hast been sent to secure a needed treaty with a distant lord. Thy host is agreeable to the proposal, but insults thy country at dinner. Dost thou, A, valiantly bear the slurs, or B, justly rise and demand an apology? Hmm, I think I'm going to go with being valiant here. The gypsy places two more of the cards upon the table. They are the cards of honor and humility. She says, consider this. Thou art at a crossroads in thy life. Dost thou choose the honorable life of a paladin, striving for true truth and courage? Or B, choose the tumble life of a shepherd in a world of simplicity and peace? I think I will go A with this one. The gypsy places two more of the cards on the table. They are the cards of compassion and honor. She says, consider this. Thou art sworn to uphold a lord who participates in the forbidden torture of prisoners. Each night their cries of pain reach thee. Doth thou A, show compassion by reporting the deeds, or B, honor thy oath and ignore the deeds? Ooh. Sworn to uphold a, law, a lord. Hmm. B to me feels like you know I'm just just following orders kind of mindset and I, I don't know like that I don't know that I like that you know maybe I'm sworn to to to, uh, to Saruman and then he starts working with orcs well you know I I don't really want to be uh, doing uh, doing evil just to to uh, keep my oath together so I think I'm gonna go with A. The gypsy places two more of the cards upon the table. They are the cards of valor and sacrifice. She says, consider this. A mighty knight accosts thee and demands thy food. Dost thou A, valiantly refuse and engage the knight, or B, sacrifice thy food unto the hungry knight? Let's see, so accosts thee and demands thy food. Finally refuse. Eh. I yeah. You know, I, I think I'll go with B. I'd be happier about it if if uh, 
you know, he asked rather than demanded, but, but, you know, maybe he's really hungry. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe he forgot to, maybe he forgot the pack. So I will be nice and sacrifice it's my second sacrifice. So I guess we'll see what that does for me. The gypsy places the last two cards on the table. They are the cards of compassion and sacrifice. She says, consider this. Thee and thy friends have been routed and ordered to retreat. In defiance of thy orders, dost thou A, stop in compassion and aid a wounded companion, or B, sacrifice thyself to slow the pursuing enemy so others may escape. Well, I don't want to do three sacrifices, and uh, I think I would do A anyway, so I am going to go with A. With the final choice, the incense swells up around you. The gypsy speaks as if from a great distance, her voice growing fainter with each word. So be it. Thy path is chosen. I don't know why I made her sound like she's falling down a hole, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there is a moment of intense, wrenching vertigo. As you open your eyes, a voice whispers within your mind, Seek the counsel of thy sovereign. After a moment, the spinning subsides, and you open your eyes to... And so we find ourselves here in the world, near the town of Moonglow, as you can see. But before we really get into exploring the world, seeing where we are on the map, all those kind of things... Let's take a few minutes and let's look at some of the uh, ancillary materials that come with this game. I'm not going to go through in detail, but just give you a basic understanding of, of some of the, uh, the manuals and things that come with this game. Because it's pretty unique to games of this time frame. So let's take a look at that now. So we've got the player reference card, which is very handy. Um, gives you tell you what the various commands are. <clears throat> so you can see there are a number of things we can do here. Um, all these different commands. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can, it tells us a bit about, gives us some hints. Um, tells us to be, um, to be keeping a journey of thy travels. So I'll be keeping some notes as we go along. Thoroughly explore cities and towns. There are secret rooms and things we need to be on the lookout for. So I'll point to those out as we get there. Um, we've got the phases of the moon, which are at the upper part here um, that we can see. Uh, and these are what explains what they are. Uh, and, and these are important because of the... Um, because of the uh, moon gates, those like the gate that showed up on the first uh, on the first episode, uh, there, there there are moon gates here where we can use to uh, basically travel from one point to the other, uh, based upon these two moons. Um, we can see um, our magical ability. Now Gizmo is a bard, uh, and so he's got one half of the enchantment potential of like uh, a mage. So I do have the ability to do some magic. Uh, obviously, our, our director of movements, uh, up, down, left, right. for uh, And then the runic alphabet. So as we'll see, the runic alphabet is everywhere, including like on the, on the map. Uh, and, and we could actually translate those. That's all translatable. The next document is the main manual here, which was the history of Britannia that they wanted us to, to read. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of information here. Um, we get into the political history. We get into geography that talks about the various areas of the land. Uh, get into the fellowship. Um, you'll see under Lord Burst's rule, one of each eight towns developed into a cultural center for each of the eight major professions. So we get mages and bards and all these different things. We've got the mercantile class, we've got weapon shops and, and all of this. So there's a lot of information. You know, nowadays you don't get nearly this information in a, uh, in a, for a game, but it's just an amazing amount of information. They give you the various creatures that you would face, information like that. We've got the spell book, which goes into a, a first of all, once again, with the runes here, um, 
but this is the book of mystic wisdom as told by Phil Pop the Weary, magician to the court of his most sovereign lord British. And this is going through, first of all, what are the reagents? We got sulfur sash, and we got ginseng, we got garlic, we got spider silk, we got blood moss, we've got black pearl, nightshade, mandrake root. Uh, so some of these things we may find in our travels. We may get them as drops from various creatures, or we may be able to buy them in towns from, from various shops. And then it goes through a list of spells that will tell us which reagents we need. So like Awaken, you need ginseng and garlic. And Blink, um, which is a form of travel, you need... Uh, spider silk and blood moss and they have very intricate um explanations for for what these things do um you get cure for curing poison obviously that would be a good one to prepare ahead of time and that is ginseng and garlic so might be good to have some of those on hand for when you get for when we get poison we get the spell we've got energy field we got my personal favorite fireball and um, a few other ones, gate travel. Um, so there are things that we can do uh, in, in, in there that we'll get to. And then we got the clue book. And the clue book gives us some information about the various towns that we'll be going to, including the, the castle and some other things. So um, this is the clue book. And, and so this is all very handy information. Uh, let's turn to the map for a second. And we can see that... Uh, you got the Ultima 4 logo, and just to the right, a little bit to the, excuse me, the left, or I'm gonna, I, this is a map, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with directions. So to the uh, west of, of uh, the word Ultima, of the U and Ultima, is a bay. And you can kind of see the, ru the runes there. They're not too different. You can tell it's like Brittany Bay, is I think what that translates to. Uh, you see this little circle of, of blue water in, in some lighter blue water. And just north of that is a largest looking building uh, drawn on the shore. And that is Lord Britain's castle. And next to it, there's a little, a little uh, drawing of a town on the uh, western side of it. And on the eastern side of it, there's a, a mostly black dock, dot. And that is one of the moon gates. And if you look around, you'll see these, there are these circles that are some degree of black and white that are an indication of um, exactly how, um, what the phase of the moon is for that particular gate. So like this one is, is this has got a, a sliver of, of white on the very left edge of it, which would be a crescent waxing. Um, there's another one that's on, on an island on the far uh, western edge that looks to be um, more like a uh, last quarter kind of moon, perhaps. You've got uh, one at the very, almost near the middle uh, on a peninsula at the very top that looks to be a full moon. You've got one also near the, in the top uh, quadrant there, but far to the west that looks to be something that might be more of a gibbous waxing kind of. So you can see these different ones here, and they're in different phases. You got the one on a, a large island to the um, east of the Ultima Four logo that appears to be a new moon, fully black. Uh, so these are ways we can do travel between them. So we will be looking at that as we go on. There are also other towns around on the map. They're not necessarily marked. Um, we're going to have to get a translation of these of these ruins so we know exactly where we're going. But for today, that's not something we really have to worry about, I don't think. So now that we've made it through all of that material and seen a little bit of the world, uh, I think I'm going to leave it there for this first episode. We will continue on into Moonglow and explore the area around us and, and start playing the game and, and see where where it takes us next. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, we'll certainly get into a lot more gameplay uh, in the next episode, and I hope to see you there. So until then, be seeing you.